Welcome to the Techpoint Africa podcast. Um, on this week's episode, we are going to be discussing three stories and thankfully we are covering much of Africa. So we have a story from Kenya, we have a story from, well, let's say Ethiopia, and then we have one story from Nigeria. But because we are Nigerians, we are beginning with one from Nigeria. Um, Zone, a blockchain-based company, has launched a POS, a blockchain-powered POS, and we're going to be looking into um, that what does that mean for the what does that mean for the company what uh, prospects lie ahead is it even necessary in the first place and then we're also going into Copia Global we've probably spoken a few times about its struggles in the last two years and we're going to be looking at some of the challenges of building an e-commerce startup in Africa and rounding off with Grow Intelligence a startup that we got news of its shutdown this month this week. Um, we're going to be looking into some of the challenges that could have possibly led to it shutting down. And with me in the studio are Abraham Augustine and Francis Obuka. They'll both be introducing themselves um, immediately. So, Abraham, let's, let's meet you. Uh, well, thank you. I hope this is clear enough. Um, my name is Abraham Augustine. I am a digital economy researcher, but I also work with Norskin Foundation in East Africa. Um, I lead communications and programs at our East Africa Hub in Kigali. Awesome. Welcome to the podcast, Ibrahim. And um, Francis? Hi, it's a pleasure having me on TechPoint. Um, as you had already mentioned, my name is Francis. I am a payments professional with extensive years of experience working um, in the African ecosystem and industry, and I'm currently the Vice President for Business Development at Zoom. Okay, okay. So without wasting much time, we're just going to get into the conversation. So yesterday, we got news that Zoom was launching a POS that is powered by the blockchain. And I'll tell you my first reaction to it. What's this again? That was my first reaction, right? Um, we have a lot of POS providers, POS prov service providers in Nigeria. And hearing that one is being launched, um, set up a few bells in my head. And so we are going to be looking at all of that. So my first question is, given that POS terminals are largely reliable in Nigeria, what benefit does a blockchain-powered or decentralized POS payment gateway, what benefit does it bring to the ecosystem? All right, yeah, I think I was muted for a bit. So... Um, it's interesting. So you've touched on two things. You've touched on POS devices. You've touched on blockchain. Uh, and I think I'm just going to disintermediate and start with blockchain technology. Um, our vision as a company, as a technology company, is to leverage blockchain technology um, to more or less build a future state of decentralized financial ecosystem that provides um, significant benefits to individuals, to businesses, and the institutions that deliver financial services to them. That's essentially what Zone does. Um, we commenced on this journey um, for a while now. We are we're happy to say we have been the first regulated blockchain company um, at the Central Bank of Nigeria, it, um, uh, and that we we obtained a we obtained a license from the Central Bank of Nigeria about two years ago in 2022, and we have been leveraging our technology to see how we can provide better efficiency to processing payments in fiat currencies um, for traditional financial service providers. Now, when I mention that, I know that's going to sound a bit strange. When you hear blockchain technology, you're able to relate that with other forms of digital assets ranging from crypto, um, you know, to stable coins and the likes. Um, so what we've done is more or less, it's, it's, it, we've learned a lot in our journey. I can bid my justice to say we are the first to explore seeing how we can provide better efficiency to facilitate the movement of value um, between individuals and businesses and between businesses and individuals with the blockchain. Um, so, so that's that as far as technology goes. And we'll begin to speak about um, another vertical, which is payments. Now. Interestingly, you had mentioned that for POS, the POS payments are very reliable. And I agree with you, uh, but they haven't always been this way. And a lot for, especially for the players, for the service providers, and you know the very popular names, um, are having to do a whole lot of work behind the scenes um, 
that costs a lot as well to be able to deliver the services in the way we enjoy them as individuals and businesses that accept payments with the US technology. So what we have done essentially is to say, okay, how do we, looking at the payment value chain and the way it is set up, how do we ensure that we can provide, um, develop and provide an infrastructure layer that sort of abstracts some of the complexities associated with processing POS transactions um, primarily to financial service providers and just allow them to carry out the, 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 their primary objectives of delivering excellent customer experience and acquiring customers um, that can enjoy and benefit from this. And that is what we have done. Um, so when you consider the payment value chain, you sort of have um, frontline providers or aggregators um, that provide POS devices to merchants um, and this could either be a fintech or it could be a bank um, but behind all of this you, you need to ensure that when a cardholder or an individual decides that they want to make payment through any method um, via um, a POS device that that payment can the, the, the funds can move from the payers account to the business's account and that process can be facilitated as seamlessly as possible. Now, I'd mentioned that a whole lot is happening behind the scenes to ensure that this can happen. We had instances where some entities are saying, hey, how can they probably establish um, some direct connections in some instances to facilitate this payment and all of that. Um, traditionally speaking, um, we know that um, cash flow can be a problem for businesses you and typically the way the industry is structured when a business decides to accept payment from you um, as an individual who has come into their store um, what typically happens and considering how the well, I say traditional sentiment system is structured today that business will typically not get value for that particular transaction that they have consummated with you in real time um, they will need to wait for, in some cases, for 24 hours before they can get that. That's on the one hand. Um, in certain other instances, you could say that uh, there are reliability issues as well associated with processing P, uh, the, the, those particular POS transactions. And this would require the providers to establish multiple connections to different banks or to different switching companies to see how they can improve upon this reliability and then last but not the least you have dispute related issues dispute and chat back issues so what we have done is as an entity first of all we are strictly a b2b payment infrastructure company leveraging blockchain technology we do not acquire merchants we do not serve businesses but we instead provide our services to the financial service providers that are doing this to them and to say we have a lot of entities today that are operating in the POS space, like you've rightly mentioned, that provide these POS devices. What we will do is to operate on the infrastructure layer and, you know, sort of absolve them of some of the challenges that they experience today in delivering quality experience to their businesses um, and to the customers of those businesses. And that's what we have done. That's our focus. That's our niche. And um, that is what we are doing today. Some of the benefits we deliver, what we guarantee um, to our customers is to say, you will be able to, for the financial service providers, you'll be able to directly connect with different issuing institutions. Now, what do I mean by issuing institutions? These are institutions that essentially hold the balances for the customers um, that come to make payments to you. So we'll be able to grant you that direct access that allows you to carry out that payment that significantly enhances reliability um, via a single point of connection. So rather than having multiple connections um, to these different institutions, we provide you um, a single setup that allows you to essentially talk to multiple institutions, building significant redundancy uh, because it's a decentralized network, um, essentially, and that's how it operates. So you have that. And then we have also, because we are able to provide real-time access to records for these payment transactions, we are able to also facilitate faster settlements um, to the financial service providers. So these financial service providers, what they do 
is the give value to the businesses, the merchants or the agents or their books. They give them value in advance for, for of when they get value from the institution of the cardholder or the payer. That's what's happening. So um, to be able to facilitate this, it means you're going to have a lot of capital locked in for that purpose. Um, you can't deploy that to any other um, uses. And so it's actually a very expensive business to run. We have significantly shortened that turnaround time in such a way that we're able to provide settlement to these financial service providers um, with a quicker turnaround time and this frees up capital that they can deploy um, to other activities, to other aspects of their operations or even expansion, if you like that. And then we, we, we can see that we have um, gone a long way to eliminating the dispute problem um as well we've been able to provide intelligence um an intelligence system that provides visibility to both the bank or the institution the, the financial service provider for the payer as well as the financial service provider for the merchant that's accepted that payment and with that we have provided better visibility and we're able to automate the refund for transactions that would have typically crystallized into dispute so Th this is the niche. This is how we view ourselves. This is our focus. This is the efficiency we are provided. And this is why we uh, believe we would be able to take on the market and win. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Francis. So uh, you, you briefly touched on um, chargeback, which is something I'm particularly interested in. We've seen a lot of um, fraud incidents in the last two years, um, both for fintechs and for banks. And one of your key propositions is eliminating chargeback fraud. And why I'm particularly interested in that is um, the vast majority of chargeback fraud is, it, it's, I mean, it's driven by humans, right? It's not really a technology problem. So how does, how, how does Zone propose to either um, reduce incidents of this or completely eliminate it? Okay, yeah. So I think when you, and if you have a good understanding of what, what, um, causes this chargeback fraud or friendly, friendly fraud, if you like to call it that. Um, it all stems from what you would call a lack of transparency um, in the way traditional the traditional payment architecture is set up today um, in the industry that's different from Zone. Um, now, for most payments that have happened, you have service providers, intermediaries, and this could be the switching company, or it could be the financial service provider that has deployed a POS terminal, or the financial service provider could be a bank or a fintech that um, has provided a card or any other form of payment to an individual. We sort of operate in a hub of spoke, um, or the industry traditionally has operated in a hub of spoke architecture. And um, this doesn't necessarily grant visibility or transparency in what is happening um, for a particular payment transaction that has been initiated across these different entities. So take, for instance, when a payment um, is initiated on the POS device, it goes to a centralized hub, which in turn is terminated to the institution that has issued maybe a card or if it's an account uh, for that particular transaction. Now, the entity that has deployed the POS device can only see what has happened on its POS device. Uh, as well as the entity that's in the middle and establishing this connection between the other two parties can only see what is happening in its own system per time. And then the entity that has also issued that card um, or that other method of payment can only see what's happening in its system. By utilizing blockchain technology and guaranteeing that we can have replicated records across these different entities, first of all, we provide transparency to what's happening um, in, uh, for, for these transactions. But we don't just stop there. Um, seeing as you have blockchain technology on one hand and you have traditional EMV systems, EMV payment systems on the other hand, we have also been able to bridge this gap by deploying a smart technology um, on the POS devices that is also able to tell us not just what's happening on the transaction, transaction processing layer, but also what's happening um, on the POS devices when the transaction is being initiated or when it's receiving a response. So um, that way we're able to archive the records for every transaction that's happened on the blockchain. And when we do that, so say a bad faith actor goes to their bank to raise a 
friendly fraud, a, a claim to say that they didn't get value for a transaction that was successful. Because we've been able to gain knowledge of what has happened in that transaction by providing visibility across the value chain, we're able to auto decline this particular transaction event. And um, so typically when you would have acquiring institutions parting away with huge sums um, in charge by fraud running from millions to even billions in some instances, we've been able to bridge that gap uh, by providing this service that sort of initiates an auto decline uh, for these fraudulent events, saving um, our clients significant value. And, and that's how we've been able to, to solve for this. All right. Um, thank you so much for that, Francis. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I'm already getting in science that I, we do not have a lot of time with you. But, uh, I mean, looking forward to how this plays out and seeing how much of a difference this can make in the industry. So we're letting you go now. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Cheers. Yeah, so we are going to be spending like a lot more time t on the two stories we have here. So we have one on Copia Global and we were discussing a bit about this yesterday. Uh, a lot of e-commerce startups or companies have struggled um, in the last two to three years as economic conditions across Africa has worsened. Um, I mean, a, a large majority of them have been startups, but it's it's not just related to them. So Copia Global has reportedly shut down operations in six uh, countries after they had you know, started operations in the last two or three years, I think. So first question is that, what do you think are some of the challenges that could make it very difficult to build and also scale an e-commerce startup in Africa? <laughs> I, 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 think, I think this is a question that a lot of us are asking. I don't know that there is one, well, I mean, your question was what are the challenges, not what, what is the challenge. Um, yeah. So definitely there is a, there's a strong point to be made about um, the, the influence of the space or the market in which e-commerce or digital commerce is happening, right? And how that affects whether a company survives or not, whether a business rather survives or not. Obviously, there are other factors, right? A company could not be the right. They could have a poor product. Um, the model maybe doesn't work. Um, maybe the problem that they are so the approach that they've taken to sort of digitizing commerce is not is not a great fit. Um, unfortunately, we a lot of what we're going to be a lot of the conversation about digital commerce in Africa is pretty much going to still be stuck at the speculation level. Right? Because even yeah. for a place like Jumia, which is a public company, right, we can see outcomes um, if Jumia goes on a, say they want to rein in costs and they are slashing costs here and there, we can see all of that. But we don't, we don't have any, like, we don't have proper insight other than what you can just gather from observing from externally and making inferences based on financial statements and whatnot. In the case of startups, it's often worse because other than shut off press releases that announce the demise or when things really get very bad or when people raise a bunch of money, it's very difficult to actually understand. To be honest, even some of these companies really find it difficult to explain their models, to explain the business, actually. If, if, you, if you talk to some, 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 some companies and you're trying... I mean, there's the part about a nice story about how we're digitizing commerce, and I get that. Um, that's a, a narrative. But from a business perspective, it's often not very clear. But it's not something that we usually pay a lot of attention to, unfortunately, until something happens that is not good news, right? Then it, it becomes, okay, mm -hmm. people start asking questions. But personally, I think the biggest factor regarding commerce, digital commerce in Africa, especially when it's not, uh, when you're not selling like um, soft items, when you're actually selling physical stuff, is that a lot of the market is still struggling under weight of poor consumption or poor consumer power, right? So people simply do not earn enough to justify, um, I don't know if you call it convenience actually, 
right? So there's not been a proper mm-hmm. connection between what does convenience really mean versus, especially when it has to do with everyday items that in this part of the world is already so broken down to like the smallest minimum. People talk about like the satchetization economy or whatnot. So when you have things that are really broken down, then ultimately what it means that the margins are very, very tiny per unit, right? So if you try to think about, okay, how do you make this work as a business and you want to do this for mass consumption, then it's very difficult. I think a greater chunk of the problem tends to lie within um, the fact that people just don't earn enough, enough money to make some of these things work, right? That's, it's not the only yeah. problem. I think it's, not, it's something that is still it's very significant. Uh, it's not obvious. Again, it's not really the only problem. And in the case of Copia, it probably is not the reason why Copia, you know, had to had to struggle. Um, there are other, there are all sorts of things. There are things like growing too fast. There are things like was this, you know, is this digital commerce really going to be something that, quote unquote, union unicorn um, scalable? Does it really have a path to becoming a billion dollar company? Are we really going to create a billion dollar entity out of people, you know, shopping for what's the what's the valuation of MTN? MTN, uh, I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but it's it should be it's definitely more than a billion, of course. Yeah, so um because MTN is listed at I mean MTN is a ten point something billion dollar revenue company that was in two thousand and eighteen. Um, it serves pretty much a consumer market, right? Um, yeah. I think MTN does not have a market capitalization of up to ten billion, even though it's a, its revenue across the whole group, um, which is not just in Africa. Actually. Yeah, seven point nine billion. Aha, there you go. So MTN is an eight billion dollar business um, with a revenue of more than ten billion. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you look at some of these things, um, look, MTN is a MTN doesn't just. I mean, I think they start they they sold their Afghanistan business, if if I'm not mistaken. But it's not just an African. Doesn't just have operations in Africa. It's not just sitting in one country. Yeah. It's not Copia that is in Kenya. It's not any one of those any one of these, you know, e-commerce companies. So one question that really needs to be asked is maybe this is a crisis of expectations, right? If you're expecting $1 billion outcome and the market is telling you that, eh, I'm not sure I can give you $1 billion from, <laughs> you know, from trying to sell food when a lot of people still basically don't care about your new mode of delivery. It doesn't just appeal to people. The environment is not just right. So there are lots of things that could contribute or that contribute to the failure of e-commerce generally. But I think, again, it depends on what perspective. If you look at this and you say, okay, e-commerce businesses are failing to actually be unicorns, then maybe there's a strong failure story there, right? But maybe if we're saying, okay, you know, are we having... Is there a viable path towards e-commerce businesses that are valued at 50, 100 million, 200 million? I suspect, right, that we will maybe not be having this sort of conversation. Because now you have businesses that are a bit more right-sized from a valuation standpoint. So, but when you begin to drive towards these huge ambitions, then you begin to run into some sort of structural problems that because you're in a market that has a very low purchasing power, those things, they magnify, the the market basically acts acts as a magnifying force on the structural defects. Say you raise a bunch of money, right? And this could be copier, this could be anybody else. Um, Again, a lot of this is conjecture because we're not sitting inside 
we're not KPMG, yeah. we're not with people who are administrators and who are having to go through the whole company's operations and identify what works, what doesn't work. But say you 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 start you know this e-commerce company, and at a certain level your unit economics work, and you're actually doing well, maybe not profitable, but there's a path towards this becoming a sensible business. Um, that can run on its own, that can do very well, probably get listed locally. But then you sort of get an infusion of capital, you know, and this capital is priced in USD, but figuratively and literally, literally because you, you raise the funds in USD figuratively because returns are expected to be generated by um, a foreign, uh, it's either you get acquired, a grand merger, yeah. or you list not in your local stock exchange because that would absolutely crash. Your local stock exchange does not even have enough liquidity. I mean, what's the market cap of the Kenyan stock exchange? Probably less than 10 billion there, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure anyways. That's That was shooting from the hip. So when you have all of these kind of factors and then you switch from doing a $100 million business and now you're, you're running into a... One billion, two billion dollar business. Eh? You have it. You begin to make some mistakes that would not have been terrible, would not have been business defining if you were smaller, right? But because now you're bigger, you're just at a much larger scale. So everything just begins to magnify itself, and maybe it begins to happen exponentially. So this is maybe one of the questions that we really need to start asking ourselves. Um, both from invest investors and investment perspective, I'm, I'm sure that people are asking themselves this question, right? But then I suspect that a great deal of this is not necessarily whether or not you received venture funding or whether or not Unicorn. A great deal of this is really just down to the fact that, look, from 2021, even while we, people were still raising at record valuations in Africa, something had changed in many African countries, you know? There was a, a, an undertrend, something had changed economically, things were beginning to look better. Look, if we were in, if 2021 was the same economic um, environment as the same economic indicators as say 2012, 2013, maybe we'll be having a different story, right? When you had a lot of African yeah. economies still on a very positive growth tra trajectory, broadly speaking, and you had the sort of maturity of companies that we had in 2021, the sort of capital in 2021, but you had the economic environment of 2012, where things were at least looking up across the continent, I suspect that the conversation about e-commerce will be different, you know? So... Maybe mm. things changed, but we didn't realize that early enough. And as a result, we didn't adjust early enough, you know, to those realizations. Because if people just don't earn enough, they just don't spend. And they can't spend, they can't enough. spend yeah. enough, you know. And there are lots of other things that you could be doing very well. But those things, people, you know, the funny thing about economics as a subject is that it, it's essentially a type of quantitative psychology, right? Because you're ultimately trying to understand how humans will behave, you know, but then the, the, the more stable quantity or the more stable var uh, variable in that equation is resources. So resources can change. You can sort of predict all of that. But when it comes to how human beings sort of react to changes, um, oh, so I don't live, That's I don't live, different. yeah, I don't live in Nigeria. I used to live in Nigeria. I don't live in Nigeria now. Like four months ago, six months ago, I could buy a one week call plan for 100 minutes for 5,000 Naira. So I can call my family back home. I can call friends normally, 100 minutes. MTN increased that thing to 10,000 Naira for 50 minutes. Now I don't make those calls. Sometimes I, it's, it's a very funny thing. <laughs> now I don't make those calls as much. I can pay that 10,000, but 
subconsciously, it just doesn't seem that valuable anymore to me. You know, whereas maybe I don't want to do WhatsApp. I want to just speak to somebody at this time. Now I'm a bit more willing to wait. Now, M10 is doing this because, obviously, Nigerian revenues and whatnot. It's a Nigerian MTN number. But I'm not in Nigeria. I'm outside of Nigeria. I'm, not, I'm pretty much not affected by how the Nigerian revenues are going up and down or whatnot. Like, with whatever variables MTN is using to make that decision, but for that roaming product, which affects me, because they are doing a revenue thing to sort of, uh, you know, maybe they want to build up revenue to sort of, I don't know, bulk up what they are losing to the economic environment in the country. They've done this across board, and now it's affecting me that uses an MTN Nigerian SIM card, but not in Nigeria, and I'm reducing my consumption. And I don't think MTN accounted for that when they were doing that, because they were doing this for people in Nigeria. So it's just a very, very interesting place where you have all sorts of variables and if you don't pay a lot of attention, and even if you do pay a lot of attention, you can miss things. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, why is e-commerce not looking like it's succeeding in Africa? Mm-hmm. That's a question that we're going to really need cooperation from the founders, mm-hmm. um, from the investors, to really be able to answer. True. And, and this, ap- this applies to pretty much any <laughs> anything that <laughs> you want to think about. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, there, there's a few things to take away from that. Um, I think it was um, Emeka Okoye who said we didn't really do e-commerce in Africa because the market demanded it. It was a case of this was happening in the West, and how about we just do it as well in in Africa and see what happens? And so we had all of that, um, all the early guys, Skunga, Fari, um, Jumia, and, and the likes. Uh, but like you mentioned, there's a whole lot to be said for the economic environment that they're playing in. I mean, Jumia, for example, had their record, their highest loss ever in 2019, just after the, um, just after they listed on the NYSE, and since then they've significantly cut down losses. However, they are not yet out, um, out of the out of the waters, right? It, there's still some, uh, there's still some problem there with, with how their their long term sustainability. So I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, and then are we flogging a dead horse? Um, are we expecting too much? from African startups. I think that's a question we should probably start asking a lot more. Are we expecting too much? Because like you mentioned, guys like MTN, MTN is like, I think it's top 10 uh, largest companies in Africa just by revenues. And it is barely making $10 billion. So are we expecting too much from startups um, in Africa? I mean, I was just checking earlier and then the largest company in Africa by revenues is an oil company. And it's a 60 plus years um like company so are we really expecting a lot more from these guys than we should be i know i know there's a conversation about technology helping to scale but are we expecting a whole lot um i mean if you're an investor listening to this we should probably have a conversation um, about this if you're also a founder um how is this sort of tempering your expectations around your projections are you are you revising some of your projections as a result of this by the way, the stat I mentioned about um, Jumia's loss was provided by Intelpoint, and you could go to the website intelpoint.co to check and get a lot more about that. So yeah, we are moving on to grow intelligence. And uh, earlier this week, well, I think it was last week, there, there was a report about a possible about it shutting down. And I think this is interesting and important for a number of reasons. One would be Grow Intelligence is not a two-year-old startup that suddenly ran out of money. It's a company that was founded in 2012, if I'm not mistaken. And it was built on a premise that we could help um, get data for Africa primarily. And I don't know if you've done any sort of work, either in business or even as a journalist, getting data in Africa is hell. You'd, there's a whole lot of struggle with getting data and then you also need accurate data and just in, in addition to that you also need up-to-date data so we definitely need all of that and there was also the infusion of artificial intelligence to make sense of the data that they were collecting so um yes the primary proposition was for the agricultural sector and then in in the climate tech space but like i mentioned growing intelligence is not a it's not it's not an upstart that is just coming out from nowhere they've been around for a while so what could have gone wrong? Um, I mean, earlier you mentioned that a lot of what we are 
discussing is just based on conjecture, and, and that's correct. But for as an outsider looking in, we heard quite a number of stories. So, what do you think could have gone wrong at um, Grow Intelligence? Yeah. So b- b- before I answer Grow Intelligence, let me just sort of double pedal to the last conversation we just had very quickly because you had mentioned something from Emeka. Uh, okay, I respect him very much. Um, about how e-commerce in Africa was not done because the market demanded it, but because it was something that was happening in the West. Right. I- I'm not sure that the market always demands things before those things come to the market. I mean, you know, um, was e-commerce demanded in the West before it was built in the West? I mean, even credit cards and debit cards, did anybody go out and say, you know what, we actually need a way to put our banking information on a piece of plastic. And then people created it. No, I don't think so. You know, So it's perfectly fine that things come to the market before the market goes out and says, we need X, Y, Z. Um, what, what the question is not whether e-commerce is demanded by the market, but whether the market is willing and able to support yeah. the pro. Again, e-commerce is pretty much a channel, a way of delivering commerce, right? The the, the question is, does the market yeah. want um, convenience and all of the other things that e-commerce does for the customer? That that's the actual product. The e-commerce, the particular model, whether it's B two B or B two C or B two whatnot is a simple channel but now to 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 come back to your question about grow intelligence um I, i've told you, i i said this to you yesterday yeah. grow is one of those companies that we we had we heard about like we know there is a grow intelligence we hear about them but that's pretty much it right uh, we don't even even as a journalist when i used to write for tech it wasn't one of those companies that was always on my radar it always was like this mature company that was doing very cool stuff. Um, and to be honest, it wasn't it wasn't a very African yeah. uh, sounding company. Not because it was not Africa. It was focused on Africa, obviously. It was collecting. But Grow is one of those companies that the narrative and the storytelling was global. It was a global perspective. It wasn't Africa was definitely a huge focus where it started where a lot of the work was being done. But um, you yeah. could do a, an internet search and you see articles like Grow is fighting world hunger. That's the direction you see, you know. Um, now, the question about Grow, and this makes it a bit a very difficult to talk about Grow, right? It makes it very difficult to talk about Grow because we don't know... Personally, I, I don't know what, what types of data Grow Intelligence collected. Like, I, I'm not sure how disaggregated it was. I don't have any real insight into the product itself. It's one thing to say, uh, it's one thing to say, okay, we, we collect and aggregate data. What types of data? How disaggregated was that data? How, to what degree was it broken down? You know, did it include, like, you know, proprietary data from, private sources or was this just an aggregation play of all publicly available data sets and then you build an algorithm on top of all of that yeah so just to so just to like provide a little context um they reportedly collected data from governments i think including the u.s government I, i'm not completely certain but they collected data from governments private companies um like you mentioned publicly available data and the focus was usually on climate tech data and um agricultural data but like you also mentioned just for us who are outside, there's no clarity on the exact kind of climate data, for example, or agricultural data that we are co- uh, collecting. So, yeah, you can go on. Yeah, so so Columbia Magazine had an article out where they were, you know, they discussed that Grow is like the largest agriculture and climate related database, which is also a different point. At some point, Grow was agriculture. At some other point, it was climate. Mm. So it felt like it wasn't sitting in any one of those boxes. You wanted to do agriculture because you, you can yield a lot of data from, from that sort of work. But then it's also climate because like climate and agriculture are interrelated and climate was a very, uh, it was a good story. It was a very big narrative. So if you sort mm-hmm. of wave the climate narrative, you 
you, you're positioning yourself properly, um, both from a business and marketing perspective, but also from a company story, you know, story uh, um, perspective. So essentially, this this uh, 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 this uh, uh, Columbia Magazine article was was done as early as or as late as last year. Right, this was late last year, and it it, it mentioned that Grow, you know, has 170 data sets from public and private sources, and even Sarah Menka said, even after you organize all of that, there's still a ton of missing data and all of that. So, but again, we can skip all the conversation about the technical and product details of of Grow Intelligence and exactly how they manage to organize and collect all of that data. That's backbreaking work. What's tough. And um, Emeka Ajene has also pointed this out when he made that tweet that got a lot of attention about growing intelligence, you know, was that find it, maybe growing intelligence found it a bit difficult to commercialize the information that he had. And I, I told you this when we were speaking yesterday evening. One of the, I think, one of the gold standards when you think about business data applications is Bloomberg. Like the Bloomberg Terminal, not the news Bloomberg, the Bloomberg Terminal. And I, I think at this point, it's very intuitive to people, right? Why yeah. at least a, great, a significant degree of Bloomberg's success. Yes, it creates a lot of data. Yes, it's the finance world, which is a very, very data heavy, intensive space. But also, it's essentially become like a tool that allows people to function in their jobs. It's not an assistant. Yeah. It doesn't just make your job easier. It doesn't just make it nicer and cooler because you're using that too. I mean, it does all of those things, obviously, right? But it's pretty much become integrated in a lot of the workflows of a lot of the, the top companies. And Bloomberg even benefits from that because you use Bloomberg, it gets the data. And then to get the data, you have to use Bloomberg. And so there's this reinforcing loop around Bloomberg itself. So I, I think that's one of the things that really makes, that sets that thing apart. And yeah. it's also the challenge that data applications, you know, need to also sort of figure out and try to resolve. Personally, I'm also working on a food systems logistics data sort of play, product thingy. And it's always, it always comes to that question, right? Is, is, is anyone going to wake up and say, for me to do my job, I need yeah. to use this tool? Yeah, data. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's only when they, when they have to use the tool to do their job that it makes a lot of sense for them to sort of be actual users. Otherwise, what happens is you begin to devolve into a consultancy. And the Ag Fonda mm. magazine that essentially announced Green Intelligence shut down had already done a piece some months back, you know, when they talked about some of the struggles. And it essentially came down to that. There's a sentence somewhere that I'm paraphrasing, you know, that says something like Green Intelligence was essentially doing consultancy projects. Which is nice. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great model on its own if you're a market research company. It's not maybe the best model if you're a technology product company. Because a market yeah. research company, you know, can say, okay, we have one, two, three, four clients. They give us a project. We do project costing. We submit a brief. We go all, we, you know, walk through all the sales cycle. We get this project for four, five, six months. We go off, out, run, do the market surveys, do research, collect data, and we deliver a report. We deliver a dashboard. We present the outcome of that project, whichever way we want to present it. For a technology product, can you imagine Bloomberg having to take on the consultancy for JP Morgan? And then they'll go out, they'll do like a six months project, and then they'll come back and give it to JP Morgan. I mean that could yeah. put in, that could be a model that they could you know Bloomberg data could have, but now it's a technology product. Um, the terminal itself now does not is not unique in itself, right? You don't yeah. need an actual Bloomberg device. You can use your laptop, you can use your phone, but the software is now sort of integrated into people's workflows. If I was a trader at some hedge fund or whatnot, I did not just rely on Bloomberg for for trade data and trade information flows, 
I actually chat with fellow traders on Bloomberg on the Bloomberg chat function. You know, I can trade jokes and it's part of my work too. It's almost like you how you go to work as a journalist, you open your computer, you go to Microsoft Word or Google Meets or whichever word application that you Google Word or whatever whatever word application that you use. It's part of your workflow. So that's it. Yeah. And that's the big commercialization question when it comes to data products. You know, again, from outside, I don't, I don't see that Grow had that thing figured out yet, um, which is very disturbing, right? <laughs> it's very yeah, so disturbing. That's just, uh, just going to cut you in. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's disturbing. And I think, um, I mean, it has me thinking right now, we've, we've seen companies with similar models, not at growth scale, but they've also experienced um, similar struggles. So, I mean, just like we discussed with Copia, um, are there certain business models that we should start rethinking in Africa um, uh, or probably our approach to them? Should we, should we really start rethinking some of these conversations? So, I mean, we are, we are running out of time, but can you in two minutes just... Um, a lot of what we've said today has been, it has pointed to the need for proper postmortems whenever companies fail. So can you, uh, one minute, I've been told I have one minute now, so in just one minute, can you just speak to the need for postmortems by people who were in the arena as opposed to just um, random, uh, random opinions by people who did not really have visibility into what was going on? We, we definitely need postmortems and we, we don't just need postmortems. We need honest, raw... Um, I, I'm going to put this on on the investors, not just okay. the founders, right? Um, running a company, building a company is a very emotional thing for founders. So maybe they will not be in the emotional headspace to really talk. Um, but people that are around the company, maybe not the CEO and the founder, maybe people just below them, operations people um, and investors, people that commit capital, it's imperative yeah. Um, it's imperative that these postmortems are not just again, Africa is a very small fish in the whole venture capital ecosystem if you do your postmortem for your small $10 million fund and you keep it inside maybe it gives you some advantage but uh, <laughs> your, the LPs that fund start, uh, VCs generally if they don't know what is happening, that's your small $10 million fund, How who will you know, who will you give money? Who will you show that? We need that those postmodels, well. not just to yeah. know. Yeah, not just to know what went wrong. We need it because that sort of transparency enhances how everybody collectively makes better capital allocation decisions, which goes back all the way to the LPs, right? Because LPs can learn that these people are learning. And uh, hopefully we begin to see more investors that don't just do this. Some of them do it internally. And it's a struggle mm -hmm. because our, our funders are notoriously closed off. But more people should be doing it publicly. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on this. I think we could have a like a longer, more extensive conversation on some of the subjects that we've discussed today. But um, I mean, that could probably require a two-hour conversation. The way I see it, or even more than that, to really dive deeper into all of this. But yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, to the view. Yeah. Thank you uh, for everyone who has stayed up to this point. I think this has been very long. So thanks so much for staying with us up to this point. Happy to. But too. Uh, you could always go check out other stories on the TechPoint Africa website, www.techpoint.africa. Um, you could also follow up with our newsletters, TechPoint Digest, Equity Merchants, and the Modern Workplace. And you would always stay updated on happenings in tech across Africa. Last but not the least, uh, Pitch Friday comes up next week, Friday. And basically, it's for early stage founders. If you are an early stage founder and you would like a place to meet with fellow innovators, get to share ideas, also pitch your startup or whatever it is you're working on, that's a place to be. For next week, I'm going to be looking at how to create a go-to-market strategy, which is very important considering the context of the conversations that we've had today. How do you prepare an adequate go-to-market strategy? So yeah, that's not a conversation you want to uh, you want to miss out on. So once again, thank you so much for staying with us, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>